everyone and welcome to English class online. We're going to be reading the rest of chapter two today of Call the Wild, The Law, Club and Fang. And one of the things to think about is this idea that book has come from a civilized world where there's order and food provided every day and care and love to one where there's an order, but it's a new order that he has to learn, and there's a new routine, and there's a new way of doing things if he's gonna survive. So he's gonna have to really work on being adaptable. And as we saw last time where we left off, Buck learned that in order to really survive, that he had to, a cat, in order to really survive, that he had to dig a hole in the snow to go to sleep. So where we start today, he's gonna to be waking up with snow all over. All right, so, and you can just read along with me on the screen. And today I'm going to try going to other screens and see how that works also to give you a little bit more background. Um, so another lesson. So that was the way they did it, eh? Buck confidently selected a spot and without much fuss and waste effort proceeded to dig a hole for himself. In a trice, the heat from his body filled the confined space and he was asleep. The day had been long and arduous and he had slept soundly and comfortably though he growled and barked and wrestled with bad dreams all night. Nor did he open his eyes till roused or awakened by the noises of the waking camp. At first, he did not know where he was. It had snowed during the night, and he was completely buried. The snow walls pressed him on every side, and a great surge of fear swept through him, the fear of the wild thing for the trap. It was a token that he was harking back through his own life to the lives of his forebears or the dogs that came before him. For he was a civilized dog, an unduly civilized dog, and of his own experience knew no trap and so could not of himself fear it. The muscles of his whole body contracted spasmodically and instinctively. The hair on the neck and shoulders stood on end and with a ferocious snarl, he bounded straight up into the blinding day, the snow flying about him in a flashing cloud. Ere he landed on his feet, he saw the white camp spread out before him, and he knew that he had remembered all that had passed before. From the time he went from a stroll with Manuel to the hole he had dug for himself the night before. So the only reason that he has even this panic instinct is him is something like wild that comes from his past. Um, like his history and his ancestors that were in the wild, because he has no personal knowledge of this, but he knows something tells him this is but then he bursts out and then he realizes, oh, I'm just in a camp. Okay, I know where I am. Like, this is not great, but at least I'm aware of my situation. A shout from Francois hailed his appearance. What I say, the driver cried to Perrault. That buck for sure learned quick as anything. Perrault nodded gravely. As courier or driver for the Canadian government, hearing or bearing important dispatches, he was anxious to secure the best dogs, and he was particularly gladdened by the possession of Buck. So unlike other people who are going to be traveling on this journey who are looking for gold, Perrault works for the Canadian government delivering mail. And so his sled dogs are used to bring mail from town to town and camp to camp. And so he's in a constant pursuit to refresh and get better sled dogs. So see, as a result, three more Huskies were added to the... Hold on a second, let's scroll up. Three more Huskies were added to the team inside an hour, making a total of nine. And before another quarter of an hour had passed, they were in harness and swinging up the trail toward the Dye Canyon. Buck was glad to be gone, and though the work was hard, he found he did not particularly despise it. He was surprised at the eagerness which animated the whole team and which was communicated to him, but still more surprising was the change wrought in Dave and Solex. They were new dogs, utterly transformed by the harness. All passiveness and unconcern had dropped from them. They were alert and active, anxious that the work should go well, and fiercely irritable with whatever by delay or confusion retarded that work. And the toil of the traces seemed the extreme expression of their being and all that they lived for and the only thing with which they took delight. So in this case, the word retarded, which you may have heard used in another context, just means slowed. Anything that prevented their progress on the trail would make these dogs go into like a hyper fury of frustration because they just want to work. They just want to go and move. Um, and you see that these dogs are transformed. These are true work dogs. This is what makes them happy. They don't want to be sitting home on a couch. They want to be working. Dave was wheeler or sled dog. Pulling in front of him was Buck, 
Then came Solax. The rest of the team was strung out ahead, single file to the leader, which position was filled by Spitz. So even Spitz is a bit of a demon. He actually is a very valuable dog to them. Buck had purposely been placed between Dave and Solax so that he might receive instruction. Apt scholar that he was, they were equally apt teachers, never allowing him to linger long in error and enforcing their teaching with their sharp teeth. Dave was fair and very wise, and he never dip, nipped at Buck without cause, and he never failed to nip him when he stood in need of it. As Francois's whip backed him up, Buck found it to be cheaper to mend his ways than to retaliate. So, better to say I'm sorry than to fight back and just do what they say. Once during a brief halt, when he got tangled in the traces and delayed the start, both Dave and Solex flew at him and administered a sound trouncing. The resulting tangle was even worse, but Buck took good care to keep the traces clear thereafter. So these are all those leather um, ropes tying them together. So whenever they get tangled up, it's a major problem. But Buck took good care to keep the trees clear thereafter and ere the day was done or before the day was done, so well had he mastered his work, his mates about ceased nagging him. So when he screws up, Dave and Solek bite him and they teach him really quickly. All right, so it was a hard day's run up the canyon through sheep camp, which I showed pictures of, past the scales and the timber line across glaciers and snowdrifts, hundreds of feet deep and over the Great Chilkoot Divide, which stands between the salt water and the fresh and the guards forbidding the sad and lonely north. They made good times down the chain of lakes, which fill the craters of extinct volcanoes, and late that night pulled into the huge camp at the head of Lake Bennett, where thousands of gold seekers were building boats against the breaking up of the ice in the spring. Buck made his hole in the snow and slept the night sleep of the exhausted just, but all too early was routed from the cold darkness and harnessed with his mates to the sled. The, that day was made 40 miles, the trail being packed, but the next day and for many days to follow, they broke their own trail, worked harder, and made poorer time. So breaking a trail is when there's nobody running on it before, so they're kind of ahead of the pack, and so they're the ones who have to go through the tall snow rather than tamping it down. As a rule, Perot, sorry, as a rule, Perot traveled ahead of the team, packing the snow with big web shoes to make it easier for them. And Francois, guiding the sled at the gee pole, sometimes exchanged places with him, but not often. Perot was in a hurry, and he prided himself on his knowledge of ice, which knowledge was indispensable, meaning they can't live without it. For the fall, ice was very thin, and where there was swift water, there was no ice at all. So, because it's the fall, everything isn't solid yet. So, if there's any breaks or thin spots of ice, the whole sled team and everything they have will go under with them. Day after day, for days unending, Buck toiled in the traces. Always, they broke camp in the dark, and the first gray dawn found them hitting the trail with fresh miles reeled off behind them, and always they pitched camp after dark, eating their bit of fish and crawling to sleep in the snow. Buck was ravenous. The pound and a half of sun-dried salmon, which was his ration for each day, seemed to go nowhere. He never had enough and suffered from perpetual hunger pains. Yet the other dogs, because they weighed less and were born to the life, received a pound only of the fish and managed to keep in good condition." So Buck is still not adapted. He's used to getting tons of food and very little exercise. And now suddenly he's been thrown into this life of just nonstop work. Excuse me. Nonstop work. And he's not getting nearly the same amount of food. So Perot recognizes this and gives him an extra half pound of fish. But still he's not satisfied. So we're going to see, can he learn to be cunning? He swiftly lost the fastidiousness which had characterized his old life. A dainty eater, he found that his mates, finishing first, robbed him of his unfinished ration. There was no defending it. While he was fighting off two or three, he was disappearing down the throats of the others. To remedy this, he ate as fast as they, and so greatly did hunger compel him, he was not above taking what did not belong to him. He watched and learned. When he saw Pike, one of the new dogs, a great malingerer and thief, slyly steal a slice of bacon, when Perot's back was turned, he duplicated the performance the following day, getting away with the whole chunk. A great uproar was raised, but he was unsuspected, while Dub, an awkward, awkward blunderer who was always getting caught, was punished for Buck's misdeed. So poor Dub gets in trouble and blame, 
Buck has learned to be smart and sneaky and steal to survive. The law of club and fang is not the law of man. The law of club and fang is the law of survival. So out for yourself only. You put yourself first. Opposite of the law of man, the law of club and fang is kill or be killed. Steal or have the food stolen from you. The first theft marked Buck as fit to survive in the hostile Northland environment. It marked his adaptation built adaptability, his capacity to adjust himself to changing conditions, the lack of which would have meant swift and terrible death. It marked further the decay of going to pieces of his moral nature, a vain thing and a handicap in the ruthless struggle for existence. It is well enough in the Southland under the law of love and fellowship to respect private property and personal feelings, but in the Northland under the law of club and fang, Whoever took such things into account was a fool, and in so far as he observed them, he would fail to prosper. So one of the things he's starting to learn is that people who operate by normal codes of conduct, politeness, moral society, meaning follow some rules of empathy and taking care of other people as well as yourself, these do not apply in the wild. And Buck is starting to learn that you'd have to be a fool to take these into account when everybody else surrounding you is vicious. So now that Buck reasoned it out, he was fit, and that was all, and unconsciously he accommodated himself to the new mode of life. All his days, no matter what the odds, he had never run from a fight. But the club of a man, the red sweater, had beaten into him a more fundamental and primitive code. Civilized, he could have died for a moral consideration, say the defense of Judge Miller's riding whip. But the completeness of his decivilization was now evidenced by his ability to flee from the defense of a moral consideration to save his hide. He did not steal for the joy of it but because of the clamor of his stomach. He did not rob openly, but stole secretly and cunningly and out of respect for club and fang. In short, the things he did were done because it was easier for them for him to do them than to not do them. So he's experiencing what's called a retrogression. He's going back into the old ways of becoming more wild and less civilized and therefore dropping the codes of civilization and all the moral laws that go around with it. His development or retrogression was rapid. His muscles became hard as iron and he grew callous to all ordinary pain. He achieved an internal as well as an external economy. He could not, he could eat anything no matter how loathsome or indigestible and once eaten, the juices of his stomach extracted the last least particle of nutriment and his blood carried it to the farthest reaches of his body, building it into the toughest and stoutest of tissues. Sight and scent became remarkably keen while his hearing developed such acuteness that in his sleep he heard the faintest sound and knew whether it heralded peace or peril. He learned to bite the ice out of his teeth and when it collected between his toes and when he was thirsty and there was a thick scum of ice over the waterhole, he would break it by rearing and striking it with stiff forelegs. His most conspicuous trait was an ability to scent the wind and forecast it at night in advance. No matter how breathless the air, when he dug his nest by tree or bank, the wind then later blew inevitably found him to leeward, sheltered, and snug. So all of these senses are just getting stronger and stronger. His sense of smell, his hearing, he can tell something a danger or if it's not and it won't wake him from his sleep. So day and night, his senses are getting honed stronger and stronger and stronger. But not only did he learn by his experience, but instincts long dead became alive again. The domesticated generations fell from him, and in vague ways he remembered back to the youth of the breed, to the time the wild dogs ranged in packs through the primeval forest and killed their meat as they ran it down. It was no task for him to learn to fight with cut and slash and the quick wolf snap, and in this manner had fought for God's ancestors. They quickened the old life within him, and the old tricks with the which they had stamped into the hereditary of the breed were his tricks. They came to him without effort or discovery as though they had always been his ways. And when the, on the still cold nights, he pointed his nose at a star and howled long and wolf-like. It was his ancestors dead and dust pointing nose at star and howling through, hold on and howling down the centuries and through him. And his cadences were their cadences. 
the cadences which voiced their woe and what to them was the meaning of the stiffness and the cold and the dark. Cadences are musical patterns and rhythms. And in this case, it's a howl and it's the cadences or rhythms of his ancestors that he's begun to flow into as he becomes part of the wild. Um, this moment of stealing just kind of irrevocably changes his whole moral attitude and destiny to one who's able to adapt and will survive at all costs. Thus, let me just scroll to the very end here. As token of what a puppet thing life is, the ancient song surged through him and he came into his own again. And he came because men had found a yellow metal in the north and because Manuel was a garden's helper whose wages did not lap over the needs of his wife and diverse copies of himself. The end of chapter two. So I hope you're enjoying the story so far. Um, this is a classic dog story. Um, it's interesting, especially at this point where we're all being asked as society to go inside and not experience nature in a lot of ways. A lot of our national parks are closed. That this is a good story of somebody being asked to go back out into nature and kind of like the opposite of where our own society is headed. Um, I hope you guys have a great day. Uh, click on the green puzzle piece and do the multiple choice to go with this. Um, if you've been following along, they should be really simple for you. I covered a lot of the points in there. All right, I hope you have a great day and hope to see you guys soon. Bye.